Well, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the webinar, Delivering Comprehensive Care, Practical Considerations. This is the second webinar in the Path to Access to Care and Treatment Comprehensive Care series. This series has been designed to support healthcare providers in setting up and strengthening comprehensive care in their centers. We're pleased that you have joined us today. My name is Miguel Escobar. I'm a hematologist from the University of Texas in Houston. Now here uh, is our agenda for the next 90 minutes. So we have uh, an excellent uh, group of speakers today. And let me introduce them. Uh, we got Dr. Johnny Malanga from South Africa. He's a professor in hematology and head of the School of Pathology in the Faculty of Health Science and, and the National Health Laboratory Service. He's also a consultant clinical hematologist at the Charlotte Makike Johannesburg Academic Hospital and director of the International Hemophilia Treatment Center in Johannesburg. His main area of research is in novel therapies in bleeding disorders in which he has served as principal investigator for over 90 international multi-center studies. We also have from India, Dr. Sukesh Nair. He's a professor of laboratory hematology at the Christian Medical College in Belor, South India, and the scientific coordinator of a proficiency testing program involving over 700 participants in coagulation. His laboratory in Belor is a training center for laboratory personnel in the welfare issue of hemophilia International Hemophilia Treatment Center program. And he's the former chair of both the Wolperation of Hemophilia Laboratory Sciences and the IEQAS committees. And we also have Dr. Daniela Neme from Argentina. She's a hematologist and medical director at the Foundation of Hemophilia. She is the director of the International Hemophilia Treatment Center in Buenos Aires and is member of the Wolferation of Hemophilia IHTC Committee and coordinator of the Subcommittee on Hemophilia at the Argentinian Society of Hematology. So welcome all. Now during this webinar, there will be simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, in French, Arabic, and Russian. Now, if you're using your computer or tablet, please click on the interpretation bottom at the bottom of the screen to select your language. If you're joining by a mobile phone, there are additional steps that you need to do. You get a look at the image on the left. It shows an Android phone. Here you click on the three dots to select the interpretation channel. The image that is in the center shows an iPhone. Select the language interpretation option, pick the language, and then make sure you click done in the upper right corner of your screen. Because if you don't do that, then your language selection will not be saved. Please use also your questions and answer box that is at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions that you might have. We will try and answer as many questions as possible later on in the webinar. We also encourage you to use the chat from any comments. So let's go ahead and get started. It is my pleasure then to introduce uh, Dr. Johnny Malanga from South Africa to discuss the delivering in comprehensive care. Hello, everyone. Uh, absolute pleasure to join you again in this program, the PACT program. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to present on delivering comprehensive care and uh, in the context of um, the, the PACT program. My name is Johnny Matlangu. I am a hematologist from Johannesburg. These are my conflict of interest disclosures. The agenda for today is a fairly straightforward agenda. I'll try and make a distinction between a hemophilia treatment center and a comprehensive treatment center. Uh, I will then move on to uh, allude to the key services in a comprehensive care center uh, by the people who deliver the service. And of course, the role of those individuals in delivering that service. And I will then uh, end the presentation with concluding remarks. Just to remind you that um, you know, the definition of a comprehensive care center uh, has been around for some time. 
it was initially defined as a hemophilia center uh, uh, is one in which the component of the comprehensive care deliverer focusing largely on the medical psychosocial expertise. And this was refined by Bruce Evert and colleagues uh, in 2004 where they defined comprehensive hemophilia care as the continuing supervision of all medical and psychosocial factors affecting the person with hemophilia and their family. It, it is the uh, basis of this that we are currently having uh, comprehensive treatment care centers because they deliver comprehensive care. In, in delivering the care, uh, there are key services that I think the comprehensive treatment centers should be delivering. Uh, and these services, in fact, are very simplistic in my view. Uh, they include the fact that um, we all need to make uh, the correct diagnosis, uh, following which we need to give the correct treatment, uh, and of course, uh, continuously need to prevent complications, both of disease and treatment. Uh, that we have given. Uh, you will notice in this presentation that the, the theme is exactly the same, irrespective of who the role player is in the delivery of the comprehensive care center. But perhaps before I go into the details of the role, uh, let me first try and make a distinction between comprehensive care center versus hemophilia treatment center. And, and perhaps I start with um, what uh, is clearly uh, commonalities between the two. Uh, both of these uh, treatment centers are expected to keep reliable and accurate records of patients who are attending those centers. They are also expected to provide patient and family and caregiver and funder education. Um, this is a, a very important component. They are expected to support prophylaxis, in particular uh, you know, prophylaxis uh, at all levels of care, uh, as well as home therapy uh, for the patients who are being treated in the centers. Uh, specifically, um, the comprehensive treatment centers needs to have a series of services uh, that may not be available to the ordinary hemophilia treatment center. These services include 24 hours access to replacement therapy, 24 hour uh, clinical service care. This is now availability of healthcare providers to look after patients with hemophilia. 24 hour lab diagnostic service. Uh, and in fact, you'll hear more about uh, that in the other presentations in this uh, uh, program. Uh, and 24 hour specialist staff, uh, including hematologists, uh, pediatricians, physicians, and of course, um, uh, pivotal in this is the hemophilia nurse who uh, understands how hemophilia care is being delivered. Uh, specialized care uh, would include, amongst others, uh, inhibitor uh, care of uh, patients with inhibitors, as well as uh, the administration of immune tolerance induction. And of course, all the other complications that uh, patients may experience, including uh, immunological complications, uh, infectious complications, and, and musculoskeletal complications. These are all the services that are expected uh, to be delivered by the comprehensive care centers. Uh, the hemophilia treatment centers may deliver some of these services uh, to, a letter, uh, to, to a lesser extent, um, uh, but, but they are not expected to deliver all of these services. The comprehensive care centers are expected to deliver the services. Uh, in, in my view, probably the most important part of a comprehensive care center is uh, all the other services offered by the other role players in um, a hemophilia comprehensive care service. That includes uh, the genetics lab and the genetics counseling, orthopedics, dental, psychosocial, uh, women and girls clinic and physiotherapy. Those are important and they should be provided at least in the setting of the comprehensive care center. And, and last but not least, in my view, is uh, the provision of a research uh, platform. Um, we could never improve patient care if we don't generate better knowledge uh, for their care. It is in that context that I strongly believe that all comprehensive care centers should ideally uh, undertaking uh, research activities uh, you know, based on their own experiences so that they can share those uh, with uh, uh, other treaters. Uh, 
Uh, talking about um, you know, uh, patient care, uh, it is important to remember that in uh, the comprehensive care and uh, environment, patient care should be at the center of the delivery of that care. Uh, as reflected in this um, uh, schema here, the patients and their families should always be the focus of uh, the healthcare providers, the patient organization, uh, society and the public at large, as well as all the funders, including uh, the government and, and of course, um, you know, private funders. Uh, without the patient, uh, the activities of the other role players may well be undermined. Uh, and I just want to focus in the context of comprehensive care, the, the role of the patient and family. What role do they have uh, in delivering uh, comprehensive care? Uh, what is their role um, in the core functions of comprehensive care? Uh, as indicated earlier on, um, I've oversimplified their role, um, and I'd like to believe their role is uh, simplistically uh, making the diagnosis, uh, giving the treatment, and uh, undertaking appropriate measures to prevent uh, complications of disease or not. Let's expand on each one of those. How do patients make a diagnosis? Uh, patients do make a diagnosis of their bleeding by identifying the symptoms of bleeding, by early recognition of the bleeding and instituting the appropriate measures. They make a diagnosis by uh, differentiating between uh, pain related to arthropathy and pain related to bleed. And of course, their family uh, uh, will help them uh, with uh, early recognition of bleeding symptoms, uh, with a change in their behavior, for example, and of course, providing them with uh, the appropriate support, including the family history and the pedigree uh, in uh, and making that diagnosis. What is the role of the patients in uh, the treatment? Yeah, very, very important. Venous access, as we know, most of uh, the treatment that we administer to patients actually require venous access. So, so they need to learn to be able to access the veins, which will be used uh, for delivering replacement therapy. They need to have enough and uh, clot infector concentrate to be able to treat themselves uh, wherever they are, uh, whether in a home environment, in, in, a, in a work environment, uh, as well as um, uh, in a, a, a relaxing environment uh, away from uh, the healthcare providers uh, and, and the team. They, they also need to recognize the importance of any treatment of bleeds, because if you limit uh, the extent of the bleeding, one is able to resolve those bleeds uh, quite uh, quickly. Um, the family can contribute uh, through a home therapy program uh, by helping with intravenous therapy uh, technique uh, support, uh, sufficient clotting factor concentrate being kept uh, for the person with uh, uh, hemophilia. The patient's role also includes uh, the prevention of uh, bleeds as part of uh, their role in the comprehensive care center. Uh, this, of course, um, uh, he, uh, talks to adherence to uh, treatment regimen, including uh, prophylaxis. Uh, uh, the fact that the patients actually need uh, to be able to be fit in order to protect their joints uh, against bleeds. Uh, weight management is very important. We are living in an era where our patients, in fact, are living longer, and therefore they need to be able to uh, be able to fight all of the chronic conditions that come with advancing age. Uh, and they need to protect themselves against injury uh, and the risk of, um, of, of trauma, uh, uh, in that way preventing the bleeds. Um, uh, and the role of the family in this regard um, is to uh, encourage them, obviously, to be compliant uh, with prophylaxis and make sure that they are participating. All of these activities uh, need to be put into the context of the target outcomes that we are looking for in a comprehensive care environment. If we deliver comprehensively um, in terms of the objectives that have been outlined, ultimately we're aiming to preserve joint structure and function. We, we are aiming to reduce and prevent um, hemophilia. Uh, and of course, um, uh, the related treatment uh, complications and uh, mortality and morbidity. Uh, we also want to optimize the quality of life of these patients in order for them to be able to meet both personal and societal needs and obligations. 
These are important goals that we should be aiming for. Uh, patients can't do this alone. Uh, as you'd expect, they will need the help of healthcare providers. And in this regard, there are many role players. Uh, healthcare providers uh, in the care of patients with hemophilia are very diverse. They include uh, hematologists, physicians, and pediatricians. Uh, they include uh, hemophilia nurse specialists, uh, social science specialists, uh, psychologists, musculoskeletal experts, geneticists, um, and lab specialists, just to name a few. Um, obviously, in the limited time that I've got, I cannot go through the accountabilities and responsibilities of each one of those uh, in delivering uh, comprehensive care. So uh, I'll take a few of these, and these are the role of a hematologist, uh, hemophilia nurse, and a lab specialist. And I'll take you through some of the deliverables that are expected from them in order to deliver comprehensive care. Let's start off with the role of a hematologist. The, the hematologist has many roles, and I've outlined what I consider to be core responsibilities and roles in delivering uh, comprehensive care. They, they are responsible for making a diagnosis, and certainly an accurate diagnosis uh, is important. Uh, through taking uh, personal and family history, uh, through physical examination of the patients, and of course, uh, appropriate investigation, including determining what the factor level of the patient is. Uh, hematologists are responsible for guiding the treatment of the patients. Um, they evaluate the treatment modalities in terms of uh, the safety, efficacy, and the pharmacokinetics of the treatment modalities. Uh, they formulate treatment guidance and guidelines. Uh, they are also responsible, in fact, for uh, putting together treatment uh, uh, protocols. Uh, and, and, and in many, many instances, they are expected to be innovative around um, the management of individual patients. Uh, hematologists are required to monitor and treat complications. There are many complications associated with the care of patients with hemophilia. They include immunological complications such as inhibitors, musculoskeletal complications, um, uh, hemophilic arthropathy being the prime example, and of course, uh, infectious complications. Uh, luckily, uh, we're seeing less and less of those in this day and age. They include, amongst others, transfusion transmitted HIV, hepatitis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The role of the hematologist. Uh, do not end there. And the one that I'm particularly passionate about is uh, they should be able to uh, start initiate and do research um, to contribute to the body of knowledge uh, in the care of patients, but more importantly, to do research in order to educate people with hemophilia uh, about the advances in the field, uh, just to name a few of those uh, important uh, roles. Talking about research, of course, research can be done at uh, different levels um, in delivering comprehensive care. Uh, of course, the, the highest uh, and, and, and the most uh, credible level is the randomized control trial uh, environment. Not everyone can participate in that. Uh, all of us can do observational studies, descriptive studies, uh, and of course, all of us can write cases or case series. So, so there is an opportunity, uh, irrespective of the expertise and the environment where you find yourself to be able to participate in one form or another uh, of research uh, in the care of patients with hemophilia in order to deliver uh, comprehensive care. Um, I want to move on to the role of the nurse. Um, a hemophilia nurse is pivotal in the delivery uh, of comprehensive care. And I've summarized the uh, critical role of hemophilia nurse with an acronym CARE. CARE stands for Clinical Skills, advocacy and advice, research and education. And uh, these roles, in fact, they form a continuum. Uh, if one looks specifically at clinical care, uh, the hemophilia nurse is responsible for teaching patients uh, how to uh, uh, access venous um, uh, uh, care uh, and uh, uh, bleed treatment, identification of emergencies, and of course, um, uh, home therapy. Uh, very, very important role of the hemophilia nurse. They also are responsible as advocates of patients with hemophilia in the comprehensive care delivery that includes, amongst others, liaising with uh, work and school uh, uh, parties, 
who may not understand hemophilia, uh, uh, making sure that the patients do not lose out on social benefits, uh, conducting outreach programs, uh, and of course, uh, being part of the multidisciplinary team and being the conductor, in fact, the coordinator of the multidisciplinary team in uh, comprehensive care delivery. I cannot overemphasize the education role of uh, hemophilia nurse, uh, and this takes the form of uh, educating patients with hemophilia, the families and caregivers, the healthcare providers, and the funders. I must admit, when I started uh, as uh, someone who looks after people with hemophilia, uh, I learned a lot from uh, the hemophilia nurses at the time, Sister Anne Krushkank uh, and Sister Gillen, uh, who were the doyens in hemophilia care in, in our environment. The nurses, in fact, are not limited to just clinical care and advocacy and education. Uh, they do undertake research. Uh, my own research program uh, has always been supported by um, uh, hemophilia uh, nurses. The, uh, the, the nurses are responsible for making patients aware of the research that is currently ongoing in hemophilia, participating and collecting data uh, and analyzing the data and research, and of course, um, initiating and undertaking their own research projects. Um, these are critical, critical core roles uh, of hemophilia nurses in delivering uh, comprehensive care. Last but not least, in this short period, I want to talk about the role of the lab specialist. Uh, you'll hear more about the role of the lab specialist, but I want to craft their role in the context of the roles that I've already described. In other words, uh, in making a diagnosis, in monitoring the treatment, and of course, in ongoing training uh, of uh, the lab specialist. Uh, diagnostic uh, care delivery takes the form of uh, making sure that the results that are being produced in the lab are accurate and reliable, that in fact they can uh, undertake studies such as the mixing studies and, uh, and be able to measure accurately the factor level, and that they provide these services in the setting of comprehensive care center 24 hours a day. If we think about monitoring uh, both disease progression as well as treatment, uh, the lab actually plays an important role in analyzing the pharmacokinetic uh, uh, you know, material that gets uh, delivered in the lab, in inhibitor assay and mixing studies, and of course in making sure that uh, the lab performance is up to national and international standards. In other words, they participate in external quality assurance programs. Uh, they are also responsible uh, for ongoing training. Uh, in our center, we send our te technical staff, the technicians and the technologists uh, for continuing uh, 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 training um, in, in, in many parts of the world so that they can bring back the, the skill sets that we need in order to be able to uh, deliver comprehensive care to our patients. We also uh, train medical students uh, and of course um, uh, train the, the technical staff on newer assays in hemophilia care. We recently set up an EMEG and assay uh, and, and, and it was the, uh, the lab that actually uh, drove the program. So if I were to summarize, in delivering a comprehensive care, uh, it is important to differentiate between the role of uh, the hemophilia comprehensive care center as distinct from the hemophilia treatment center. Uh, what I have alluded to are the roles and responsibilities for successful implementation of comprehensive care uh, program in hemophilia. And that, in fact, the, the, these roles have not changed over many decades. They include, uh, in a summary format, the fact that all of the role players uh, are required to make a diagnosis, are required to treat, uh, and are required to monitor both uh, treatment and disease complications. The critical role in the delivery of the comprehensive care include uh, patient hemophilia nurse, uh, uh, hematologists, and the lab uh, coming together to deliver that comprehensive care. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the question and answer session. All right, thank you, Johnny, for your uh, detailed presentation. Now, a reminder to the participants to please enter your questions in the questions and answer box on the bottom of your screen. 
Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sukesh Nair to cover diagnostic services at a treatment center. Good evening, uh, good morning, and good afternoon to some of you. Um, welcome to the uh, session uh, by the PACT. Uh, my job is going to be taking you through the diagnostic services at a treatment center. I have no uh, conflicts of interest to declare. Uh, we'll start this journey through a patient who came to us, um, a seven-year-old boy who presented with uncontrolled bleeding following a road traffic accident three days back, which was being surgically corrected. Uh, unfortunately, didn't get correct. And he has been brought to this hospital as this hospital only stocks factor concentrates. This patient has been history of spontaneous large swelling at the back of the thigh with discoloration. He was symptomatic from two years of age, uh, prolonged bleeding from wounds, sometimes requiring blood transfusion at his village hospital. And he's got history of knee pain with knee joint swelling and now walks with a limp. So there is hemarthrosis. So obviously we know that this could be a possible uh, patient with hemophilia. His 25-year-old mother says she has easy bruisability and two socket bleeding, but nobody in her family has any bleeding problem. Her father is 70 years old who had a hernia repair that was totally uneventful. <clears throat> so what are the screening tests for a person who presents with bleeding? Uh, of course, you have uh, the you know, uh, classical, uh, this thing about platelet count, then you have uh, bleeding time, then you have prothrombin time, which looks after the extrinsic pathway factors and the activated partial thromboplastin time, which covers the intrinsic pathway factors, basically covering the entire coagulation pathway that leads to the formation of thrombin and the clot finding. So this patient had a normal platelet count. The prothrombin time is, was 10.5, which is normal within the reference range, and APTD was 92 seconds, which is also uh, beyond the reference range. So obviously, as expected, he has got uh, a prolonged APTT, like we get in patients with hemophilia. So now, this hospital only does basic coagulation tests and mixing studies with normal plasma. So <clears throat> what is mixing studies? In fact, mixing studies is the most important test you should have in a place which manages patients with bleeding, not just bleeding, inherited bleeding disorders, any bleeding. Because this is, it's a very simple procedure. It is mixing equal volumes of the uh, test plasma, which gave the abnormal time, with normal pool plasma normal pool containing all factors which are present in normal quantity, which is 100%. And then you repeat the test on the mixture. If you get correction of time on the repeat test, that means we are dealing with a deficiency of factor and there is no correction. That means we are dealing with an inhibitor or an antibody against phospholipid or heparin. So <clears throat> the rationale is that if the prolongation in time, which is like the APTT is prolonged, is due to deficiency of a factor in the test plasma, the normal plasma will provide the deficient factor when they are mixed and correcting the prolonged time. However, if the prolongation time is due to an inhibitor, antibody to a factor or heparin, the normal plasma will also be inhibited and the time will remain prolonged. So the distinct advantage of this procedure is that it has got direct interpretation therapy. Suppose you have a patient who is bleeding on an operating table <clears throat> and his APTD is 65 seconds. When you get correction of time on mixing studies, will directly mean that the normal plasma supplied the deficient factor means if you transfuse the patient normal plasma like FFP for the clotting defect, the prolongation of time will get corrected and the bleeding will stop. However, if the time doesn't get corrected, then there is no benefit in transfusing FFP because it's not going to help. In fact, identify what the inhibition is. Is it heparin? Then you can use protamine to stop the bleeding. And if it's inhibitor, you need to identify other agents. The only issue with the mixing study, which you should keep in mind, is that it could miss uh, low titer factor 8 inhibitors, of course, high titer inhibitors can be picked up, but low titer factor 8 inhibitors can be mix, missed in um, standard mixing studies. So coming back to the mixing study on this patient, we get complete correction, 35 seconds, which is uh, within normal range when we mixed it with uh, pool normal plasma. So now we know that the patient has a factor deficiency. We know he's got hemophilia, but how do we treat? We don't know whether it's A or B. So we can create an, a selectively deficient uh, system in your lab, uh, sometimes it's all, always present. So adsorplasma is basically removing the vitamin K dependent factors with the help of barium. And that means what remains after adsorption is only five, eight, and of course the uh, 11 and 12 along five nodule. Now age serum is something that's always available in any hospital, which may have a blood bank or a biochemistry lab, because normally for testing you use clotted blood. So blood is collected in a tube, it clots, during the clotting process, we, we will lose the fibrinogen and prothrombin. 
what remains behind uh, and of course uh, if you keep it over two days to three days all the labile factors like factor 5 and factor 8 will disappear so what remains in the age serum is 9 10 11 and 12 so this is also selective plasma or selective serum uh, so the advantage of age serum is that always you can go, go and ask the lab uh, do you have a uh, two day old serum or a three day old serum and take it now how does that work suppose i have a patient with a known hemophilia let's say he's hemophilia a you can see that his plasma does not contain um, uh, you know factor 8 so his apd is abnormal which is 90 seconds now when you mix his plasma with adsorbed plasma it recovers factor 8 and when you repeat the aptt you will get aptt will come normal but when you mix the patient's plasma which gave an abnormal uh, aptt of 90 seconds uh, you know that the age serum does not contain factor 8 so mixture will not have factor 8 aptt will remain prolonged so when you have a prolonged aptt where the correction is obtained with adsorbed plasma but not with age serum you can make a diagnosis of factor 8 deficiency and of course this patient's uh, result you can see that there was no correction with age serum and there was correction with adsorbed plasma so we now know that this patient has got factor 8 deficiency that's all we can say now if you have some difficulties with those particular uh, adsorbed plasma and age serum uh, you can realize that uh, you may have used vial of factor 8 concentrate which may be used two or three days back uh, you can probably harvest two or three drops from that and then if you dilute it one in four and then from that diluted uh, factor concentrate if you just use a very small amount 10 microliters of factor 8 concentrate diluted factor 8 concentrate into 250 microliters of patient's plasma the patient's plasma's factor 8 levels will increase to 100%, which will be almost normal in a person with hemophilia. And you repeat the APTT. So if the APTT is corrected, that means we are dealing with a factor 8 deficiency. If it remains abnormal, it could be factor 9 deficiency. And you can, use the, you can do the same with factor 9 concentrate, and you can probably identify factor 9 deficiency. Uh, if there is no correction with both, then probably we are dealing with high levels of factor 8 inhibitors, which you need to confirm with the inhibitor screen. Uh, so now we have uh, this patient who ha we have identified that uh, he has got factor eight deficiency because his APTT corrected on fact with factor eight concentrate and not on uh, not with factor nine concentrate. Uh, so is the diagnosis complete? Because we also know the mother has symptoms. We know that sometimes you may have obligate carriers who may be symptomatic. So maybe he she's also an obligate carrier for hemophilia. So one of the tests that you must definitely do, especially in a person who has got such a history and has blood transfusion. You should always do an inhibitor screen uh, because sometimes you need to pick up low titer inhibitors which can be missed by the, mix, uh, the mixing studies uh, so it's basically incubating the patient's plasma along with the normal plasma for two hours and then comparing it with a fresh mix of the patient plasma and normal plasma if the incubated mix is more than 10 seconds compared to fresh mix definitely there's an inhibitor some people like to use eight seconds also as a difference uh, but however, you can improve the sensitivity of this test by using a normal plasma where the factor rate is not 100%, but 50 to 60%. And of course, a good APTT reagent and inhibitor screen can be a very good test. So you must realize that all these tests require um, some skills because, you know, you have to do the PT and APTT using a water bath. Uh, you know, uh, this is a manual tilt method. So you have to add the reagents and the plasma and then take the tube out of the water bath, tilt it, or take it back to the water bath because we are trying to see the movement of the uh, plasma along with the reagents and moment the plasma clots, the movement will stop. So you can stop, you can click the stop button. There is definitely a challenge in relation to uh, this diagnosis because uh, as I said, manual tilt tube method requires a little bit of training. Uh, so trained personnel have to be available. Availability of reagents, which is probably the biggest challenge. Then of course, uh, for coagulation requires good sample collection and bigger, it gets compounded by uh, low referrals because testing will become uh, difficult. Then of course, you need to have motivated personnel uh, because many of these tests are not mandated like you know HIV, hepatitis B testing, blood bank testing, which are mandated testing. These are non-mandated. So you need personnel who are motivated. Now, lack of reagents is the biggest issue uh, because that's what we have seen uh, over, over the years. Either there is no supply or the manufacturer or supplier is not available. And even if it's there, it is not regular. Mainly constrained by the fact that these expensive, these uh, reagents are not cheap, uh, and they also have shorter shelf life. And also, you must realize that all the tests that need to be done has to be done within a short window, within four hours of sample collection. So all this makes 
the consumption of reagent, if it's not done adequately, very difficult. So, uh, and also there are stringent issues of sample storage as well as reagent storage. So how can we overcome these challenges, especially in a low resource environment? Uh, we know that uh, reagents are not a big issue in most of the, because many of the good manufacturers have <clears throat> had a deep reach into way, way, various parts of the world. Uh, but frequency of testing is an issue because sometimes when you start a lab, you may get a sample once in a month or once in a week, which can make uh, it life difficult because you know many of these reagents, um, uh, you know their shelf life, once you open it, they mention it as one week. And they are not less than three ml, which is five ml is usual, but three ml sometimes you can have it. If you're doing a manual method, the tilt tube method, you may use uh, almost one third of the reagent. And if you're using an uh, automated coagulometer, you may only use one tenth of the reagent. So you have only one sample. The next sample will come only a month later. And you have uh, said that the uh, sample is only stable for one week. So you can imagine the amount of reagent you may have to uh, waste. But can we overcome that by some simple adjustments? Uh, that is maximize on what is available and minimize the waste. So you have a uh, refrigerator here. You take the reagent. Make sure that the reagent remains mostly in the refrigerator. Whatever is required for the test, only that is taken out and the uh, reagent is kept back. I have seen that this type of um, uh, methodology can uh, allow you the use of reagent for almost a year. Uh, so for uh, hemophilia, you need many other tests like factor assays and inhibitor detection. Of course, um, uh, APTT reagent solutions we have seen, but uh, selection should be a reagent which is very sensitive to factor deficiency uh, and low sensitive for lupus antiquity. Factor assay reagents are a little bit more challenging because you need a normal reference plasma. Uh, then you need factor deficient plasma, which is the most important part. You can make it in-house uh, if you have a consenting patient with severe hemophilia who has normal levels of onvolumens factor, complete lack of factor eight, not contain any inhibitors, uh, and contains only normal concentration of all the other factors and negative for viral markers. Similarly, reference plasma you can make from consenting normal individual. For getting the factor eight and factor nine concentration close to 100%, you need to at least pull 20 normal people. And pulling 20 normal requires a lot of effort. And it's worth it if you are able to make aliquots and store it. But you know, storage has to be at, under stringent conditions. Like if you have got a minus 80 degree centigrade freezer, where the cost is about 10,000 to 15,000 US dollars, you can keep the reagents for up to one year. Otherwise, you have to use minus 20, which is also not cheap. It is 3,000 to 4,000. Now, to find out whether whatever you are making in-house is good quality, you can easily have a small uh, method in which you can say your one in 10 dilution of your uh, reference plasma is 50 to 60 seconds, which tells you that there are adequate amount of factor rate, close to 100%. And if your clotting time between series uh, of dilution uh, is between five and eight seconds, that means your factor rate deficient plasma is also in good condition. Now, you can possibly use domestic freezers, uh, which are used by ice cream vendors. They are quite good uh, because we have used it quite effectively a long time back. Uh, they can give temperatures of minus 20. You can keep reagents up to uh, three months if you don't keep on opening these uh, freezers that much. Of course, once you have done all these in-house procedures, make sure that you have to increase the reliability uh, of these tests and reduce the risk of failure by doing good internal quality control. And even controls you can make yourself by using normal plasma as pool normal plasma and harvesting plasmas of patients who come for INR uh, of 2 to 2.5. You freeze that in small amounts. And then after, uh, when you accumulate 20 and 30, you can thaw it and aliquot them, uh, mix it, aliquot them, and then uh, make them as abnormal controls. So suppose you have diagnosis which is not available. You can possibly use a very crude method where you can add one ml of blood to a plain glass tube. And you can see that uh, a normal person will clot in 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, but if a patient does not clot even after 60 minutes, you know that this patient has a severe to moderate deficiency of a coagulation factor. So what you can do is you can take three vials and label them as uh, unlabeled, eight and nine. And then you add one ml of blood into each of these vials. And then you add a factor concentrate, diluted factor concentrate with a dropper. Just one drop is 50 microliters, and that will ensure the factor eight levels or factor nine levels will increase to 100%. So at the end of uh, this, uh, only the clot is only detected in the tube labeled factor eight. We are diagnosing hemophilia A. If the uh, clot is only developed in uh, the third tube, which is the factor nine tube, then it's hemophilia B. 
And if it does not clot in either of the tubes, it could be a patient who's got hemophilia, I mean, who comes with a history of hemophilia, may have inhibitors. So our patient has got, uh, has clotted with factor eight concentrate, and therefore we can easily make a diagnosis of hemophilia A. But finally, when we did a bleeding time on this patient, it was more than 15 minutes. So he was diagnosed to have type three von Willebrand's disease, which can also have similar symptoms like hemophilia. So it is possible even when there is no facility to differentiate in a severe bleeding disorder, as having either severe hemophilia A or severe hemophilia B or severe type 3 von Willebrand disease. All you need is a syringe, needle, blood lancet for doing bleeding time and some glass containers. But please remember, bleeding time is not an easy test. It's one of the most difficult tests in hemostasis. It needs a good understanding of its performance characteristic. Though it's defined as a time taken by a standard skin wound to stop bleeding and the wound has to be made a stab wound and make sure that the wound is made properly so that you can see the blood welling up. You should have that much bleeding at the end of 30 seconds. And the blot will also show you the amount of blood that comes out. And that will also be a measure of whether you've done the bleeding time normally. Bleeding time is a good parameter in evaluation of patients with primary hemostatic disorder, only in those who have a history of bleeding, not otherwise. So finally, whatever numbers or tests that you establish, please participate in a good external quality assessment scheme like the IEQAS program of WFH. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nai, for your presentation. And now um, we'll go to the last presentation. So I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Daniela Neme from Argentina, who is going to talk about outreach and patient identification. Good morning. It is my pleasure to share with all of you this webinar. And I thank the World Federation of Hemophilia for having invited me to participate in it. I will share our experience in the identification of patients with hemophilia and their training. The certain identification of patients allows us to find more people with a bleeding disorder, incorporate those people to the comprehensive support network and finally to detect early on and to provide the right medical care to these patients. Our institution, the Foundation of Hemophilia, is in Argentina, the national um, member organization of the World Federation of Hemophilia. It was established in 1944, and not only is it a patient's organization, but also it is a multidisciplinary care center for hemophilia patients. Along these years, our institution has created a network for the care of hemophilia patients throughout the country, establishing links with treatment centers and with hematologists devoting to the care of patients with bleeding disorders. It has also taken up training and education of many specialists and it has established the most important registry of hemophilia patients in Argentina. It is very important to consider the education as a pillar to achieve change and this education has to reach all the stakeholders involved in the management of hemophilia patients. The state through the different agencies that are involved and that define the disease as a public health po policy, the relationship with the different HMOs, with the society in a patient that is in the work environment or in schools or recreational settings, the education for professionals of healthcare that are going to look after the patients, and finally, the patients and their families. The implementation of certain strategies is fundamental to attain our goals. At government level, we have managed to get the full coverage of the treatment for hemophilia patients that involves not only the anti-hemophilic concentrates, but also the bypassing agents for patients with inhibitors. Also, the acceptance of the home treatment as the ideal form of managing hemophilia patients, the introduction of prophylaxis, immunotolerance, new drugs, and also in 2018, 
we had the first purchase of factor 8 concentrates. It is our challenge to have a national registry of hemophilia patients through the Ministry of Health. With regards to healthcare professionals, the Foundation of Hemophilia is an international training center of the World Federation of Hemophilia since 1972. We have a very close communication with the different professionals in charge of the management of hemophilia patients in the different cities of our country. We also have an annual meeting where we can share our experiences, our ideas, and our concerns, and we also have a local guideline for the management of hemophilia that allows us to maintain it as a document not only for healthcare professionals, but also for auditors and also for the different government agencies. And with regards to education of patients, families, and the society at large, our center has an annual program of educational workshops that involve all the disciplines. Among them, we have a practical workshop where we teach the infusion both to patients and families. We also have a workshop for school educators, a group of parents who is made up by parents of children with hemophilia, and they accompany the different families, especially in their first steps after the diagnosis of a child with hemophilia. We also have workshops for carriers, uh, for job hunting, also those that emphasize the rights of patients and access to treatment, uh, workshop for uh, games for children, educational activities that we carry out in different cities of the country. We have uh, printed educational material and we organize uh, recreational activities. How do we communicate with the patients? Well, we do it through a magazine which is national and where we share medical papers of interest and the social recreational activities that w are carried out in the different cities of our country. We have a web page and all the social media through which we invite patients to register in our center and to be part of our community. With respect to the identification of patients, it is key to have a strategy to uh, have a family tree for from the moment a family member is diagnosed with a bleeding disorder, in this case hemophilia. Why is it important? In order to identify new diagnoses, especially in the case of families with mild hemophilia where the patients may not be diagnosed and may be asymptomatic or have mild symptoms. And this allows us also to identify carriers. The search for women carriers or with the potential of being carriers has to be present at all times. It is important to bear in mind that their identification allows us to determine the hemorrhagic risk, provide genetic counseling, provide counseling with regards to perinatal management and get an early diagnosis in case of a neonate with hemophilia. The search for carrier women can be done through uh, the family tree in the follow-up visits of patients with hemophilia, ask them about their brothers or sister or their daughters and encourage them to bring them to the office. It is important to take in consideration all education mechanisms like workshops and through the social media invite all the female components of a family with hemophilia to be studied or tested. And to close, I would like to highlight some premises and provide some advice. Let's remember that the organization of patients is crucial in order to have mutual support, get better knowledge of their disease, information about prevention and treatment, and eventually to generate a change in how people go through their disease. The healthcare professionals have to be involved 
and have a proactive activity vis-a-vis -vis this organization. Let us remember that the best treatment for a hemophilia patient is the one he or she receives in a treatment center. And it is also important to have a public health policy because that's a way in which the state undertakes an explicit and active role vis-a-vis -vis the disease. We have to encourage patients always to be involved in this organization and to establish a short, medium-term and long-term goals, also to establish specific steps in order to achieve each of the goals proposed. And always remember that education is key in all the stakeholders involved in the management of patients with hemophilia. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Neme. And uh, I think we've seen, you know, three excellent presentations that really touch on very important points that are related to what we talk about, the comprehensive care. So now I'd like to, um, you know, give some thought and I'll, you know, so give some additional considerations in, in the care delivery. Uh, and I'll try to, you know, also uh, make a summary um, here of, uh, you know, what we've seen today. Next slide, please. Um, so we know that the hemophilia treatment centers, you know, and, and, and the regional and national networks, you know, whatever it's available in the different countries, uh, deliver what we know what's called integrated, you know, patient-centered care, that it's going to reduce morbidity, mortality, and actually the overall cost of the care of patients with hemophilia. And at the same time is promoting a longer lifespan and is going to improve the outcomes of those patients. Now, over the last 40 years, the hemophilia treatment centers, you know, have emerged as a specialized and multidisciplinary healthcare centers that have very unique expertise, you know, to meet the physical, the psychosocial, and the emotional needs of patients with hemophilia. Uh, optimal outcomes, you know, are achieved uh, using this team-based multidisciplinary shared decision model uh, that we already know it works quite well. Now, specifically, the centers offer integrated and comprehensive diagnostic and treatment services, which include, as we've seen in the talks, you know, prevention, education, counseling, case management, case coordination, outreach, research, and surveillance. Now, patients with hemophilia, you know, who reach now older age, you know, over the last 20 years, we've seen a huge difference. The lifespan of patients with hemophilia you know, has expanded. Uh, remember in the 1900s, a patient with hemophilia would only live maybe about 13 years. To date now, a patient lives similar to a, an individual that doesn't have hemophilia, you know, over 70 years. Uh, now we also have seen an increase uh, uh, diverse population. We're serving definitely more patients. Now, if we look at the statistics between 1990 and let's say 2010, the number of women that has been treated at the HTCs has increased by 350%. And the proportion of other congenital bleeding disorders, such as von Willebrand, has also substantially increased. So this is very important. Now, going back to the hemophilia treatment centers, we know they provide patients with hemophilia and other coagulation disorders. Uh, <clears throat> you know, their caregivers, the healthcare providers, the insurers, the policymakers you know, in, in the form of an integrated disease management. And this integration is only possible through a core care team that, as has been explained in our first presentation, includes the hematologist or a medical director, a nurse, a physical therapist, a social worker, and uh, having access to a specialized coagulation laboratory. Now, this is certainly complemented by an extended team uh, that will compromise, you know, professionals that are going to be related to the management of these patients, like orthopedic surgeons, nutritionists, genetics counselors, psychologists. I mean, any other team member that you think it's important to the care of these patients. Now, something that also uh, was mentioned is the, the hemophilia treatment centers, where we give this care. Uh, we adhere to treatment guidelines, you know, to standards and recommendations that are uh, been developed by the different associations. We follow the recommendations and the guidelines of the Welfare Asian of Hemophilia for the management of patients. 
Uh, now, it's important to you know that this operational organization of hemophilia treatment centers, you know, is going to enable uh, responsiveness to patient needs at all times. And our goal is here to try to identify gaps in the care and planning education opportunities around these gaps. So again, this model, uh, I, I think it, it, we've seen that it is the ideal way to take care of patients, you know, with hemophilia and other bleeding disorders. Next slide. Now I wanna make emphasis on, as part of the coordination of care on the referral systems. Uh, I, I understand that, you know, every country, every institution is gonna have different ways to having referrals, uh, you know, in, way, in the ways how those patients get sent to the different institutions. And there are different routes, as I mentioned. But I think it's very important to be able to develop a network uh, of, you know, from coming from those hemophilia treatment centers. And this is a network that you can develop with your different specialties, with your colleagues, uh, outreach networks in the community, in the rural areas, uh, being able to communicate, to educate uh, other physicians, other healthcare providers in the emergency rooms, uh, your OBGYN colleagues, your surgeons, your pediatricians. Uh, so at all levels, it's important to be able to try to identify these patients as soon as possible so they can be referred to the different hemophilia treatment centers. Now, at the same time, once you make that identification, it's very important to be able to trace the, those families, to be able to find the carriers. Uh, because again, those are patients that should be managed in your HTCs. Now, it's a question that we always get asked, you know, that, you know, do I really have a hemophilia treatment center uh, just because I'm not able to get all my team together? I don't have all the specialties in the same floor in the same building. Well, this is really not necessary to do because most places don't, do, don't have that kind of facility. As it was mentioned, it's important to be able to form that core team, right, which includes your hematologist, the nurse, the physical therapist, the laboratory. Uh, you know, just a basic team. And from there, you can expand. You can have your surgeons, you can have your genetic counselors, uh, your OB, and they can be in different buildings. They can be in different institutions. The important thing is to be able to form that network that you can rely on them and you're going to be able to refer those patients to them. Uh, and, you know, the, the coordination of the treatment should be done through the hemophilia treatment center. Now, how about if you don't have any, let's say, trained specialists in bleeding disorders in your area? Well, that's when, you know, you should be able to rely on your hemophilia treatment center to be able to provide that training. If you don't have it in your country or in your institution, then there are ways that many of those individuals can be trained outside. Uh, you can look at your neighboring countries, for example, or you can go through the different uh, programs that are available around the world. You know, one of them is, for example, the hemophilia treatment center training uh, that you can get grants through the uh, World Federation of Hemophilia, or there may be other means that you can use to be able to have training uh, to some of those specialties. But the important thing is to be able to recognize the individuals that really, that wanna work with the, with the hemophilia community and be able to find training for them. Now, one of the other recommendations, and I think uh, Dr. Neme gave a very good example, is that working very closely with your patient associations. It's critical to be able to have, uh, you know, that close relation uh, with the association and as well with other departments, with your uh, institution, as well as with the different areas of the government. You know, the patient associations usually are the ones that will be able to refer many patients to you. I can tell you in our example here, for example, in Texas, where we have a large number of patients, the patient association are critical uh, for the management of our patients. They're the ones that refer many of our patients. They have close communication with the patients and the families. So it is important to be able to work closely uh, with that group of individuals as well. Next slide. So to uh, kind of summarize what we've seen today, I think we, uh, we, we saw in, in Dr. Malanga's um, presentation the importance of that comprehensive care. I think that it's been emphasized, you know, really in, with a lot of detail, how, you know, this type of care needs to be, uh, you know, be given to our patients. 
Again, you don't need to have a huge team to start with. You can have a small core team to be able to initiate uh, you know, the care of these patients. You can start with you know, one clinic a month. You can start increasing your clinics more often really as needed. And he mentioned about, you know, it is critical to be able to have this triad with, we, we talked we talked about diagnosis, treatment and prevention. It was also discussed the role of the different players in the system. And I'm talking about the multidisciplinary team. You know, it is important to recognize that every single member is as important as the other. You know, we're talking about a nurse, you're talking about a physical therapist, the hematologist, the laboratory. It, they play exactly the same role. So it is important, every single one of them. And again, they all play a critical role. And the only way that we're able to provide care is as a team member. We discuss about the importance of having that hemophilia network, uh, including you know, having a registry. And this is something that has been emphasized by the World Federation of Hemophilia to start with a registry. You can start with a local registry, and then you know, start increasing the number of those patients going into the other hemophilia treatment centers and you know, whatever they are located in your country. That is critical to be able to have a national registry because it's the only way you're gonna, first of all, figure out how many patients you have and also be able to make some predictions, especially for treatment. You know, what are you gonna need uh, for those patients for the next year? How much, uh, what amount of factor are you gonna have? you're gonna to need to manage those patients with hemophilia A, with hemophilia B, with von Willebrand. And you're gonna to need to rely, again, in your laboratory to be able to have an accurate diagnosis for those patients. Now, uh, as we've seen in the three presentations, education is critical and at all levels, starting from the patients, from the family, from the caregivers, all the way to the top, you know, the healthcare providers, and all the way up to you know, the, the, the individuals that make decisions like, you know, the governments or the, the payers. So it's important to be able to have that communication in all directions. Now, we saw the importance of, you know, having a reliable laboratory for diagnosis. And I think this sometimes, you know, brings some challenges because I understand, you know, in, in some countries it's difficult uh, to be able to have, you know, a, a, a complete laboratory. But I think Dr. Nair really explained with detail uh, some of the challenges and some of the solutions that you might be able to provide, uh, you know, to some of those problems. And I think this uh, will probably, we'll have more discussion uh, during the questions and answers, because I think it's important to be able to have that laboratory that could provide you with an accurate diagnosis. And then again, the importance of having that outreach and patient identification is extremely important. Uh, next slide. So I think that, you know, as part of the comprehensive care, you know, how we can implement or enhance the comprehensive care, again, identify those members that are interested in working with patients with leading these orders is critical. Um, and I think that's the way we all, all have build our hemophilia treatment centers, is asking around, seeing who's really interested in working with our patients, you know, that physical therapist, that uh, genetic counselor, the surgeon, the OBGYN, and you'll find people that are interested. Uh, form that multidisciplinary team of specialists. Uh, try to identify those patients at all levels, you know, starting from your own center, your own institution, and then going out to the clinics, going out to the peripheral areas, going out to the, uh, to the community, being able to build that registry. Then have that reliable lab uh, the laboratory at all times, you know, try to develop guidelines uh, that, you know, you have many so resources that are able to be able to help you with that. And then at the end, certainly our goal is to try to provide treatment for all our patients. Next slide. So I encourage everybody to look at the guidelines that were recently published by the World Federation of Hemophilia. Uh, these guidelines, you can find them in the website of, of the uh, well, WFH. And they're quite detailed. I mean, these guidelines, you can download them for free. They're in different languages. And you see here, it has 12 principles of care that I, you know, I'm not gonna go in detail, but you can find those uh, guidelines there that are very extensive. And I think it will be very helpful, especially to be able to uh, develop your own guidelines, you know, to manage patients with hemophilia. So with this, I think we can uh, move now to the questions and answers. 
uh, we have many of them. And if I would like for our speakers to please turn their cameras on. And I will start, you know, with some of those questions. Um, one of the first questions we have here, it is um, coming from one of our participants that say, do you think palliative care provider should cooperate closely with the hematologist regarding chronic disabled patients to avoid drug addiction? And I'll probably, uh, we'll have maybe Johnny, if you could answer this question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, yeah, and thanks for the question. Um, in my experience, uh, this is very limited experience of about 25 years looking after patients with hemophilia. Uh, I'm not of the view that drug addiction is an issue. Uh, this is obviously in contradistinction to other diseases I look after, for example, sickle cell, etc. So, so that is perhaps the, the one, the one uh, you know, point I want to make. Uh, there is no reason uh, why uh, one should not be as comprehensive as you can, can be. But one needs to also be aware that you know, if you bring uh, specialities you know, such as palliative care, uh, you, you might just give psychosocial implication that uh, hemophilia is a disease that leads to terminal care, which is not the case, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, and I've worked across the board. I've worked with cancer patients. I've done transplant. And the, the survival in hemophilia, in my view, uh, certainly uh, should not be conflated with the uh, care of patients who are likely to be uh, you know, undergoing terminal care, as in palliation. Um, whilst I'm for, and I'm open-minded about being comprehensive about involving all role players, I would be very, very careful about bringing uh, palliative care specialists into hemophilia care. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, now I have a patient uh, for Dr. Neme, and the question is, what in your experience is the best way to educate patients to play their role in their care? Well, I think that uh, as I said, uh, the education is a, a pillar of change. Um, so I think that there are many uh, tools that we can um, use as um, workshops, uh, groups of patients, um, also, of course, in the visit. Uh, I think that it, it is very important to engage the patient to be involved in, in their own, um, in his own management. Uh, it's not just, um, I will um, uh, accomplish the indication of the uh, physician, it's also, uh, I have to be careful uh, about uh, how um, I um, adhere and uh, the treatment, uh, prevention, uh, preventive measurements. Um, uh, so I, I think that uh, it is uh, like a training um, uh, situation uh, and, uh, it is uh, very common to hear that uh, I have been a patient for 20 years, okay, but it is never late to, uh, um, to learn how to treat, how to manage a, a, a bleeding. Um, so I think that, uh, again, education should always be present in the management of people with hemophilia. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Dr. Nami. Now, uh, for Dr. Nair, there's a question here, and, and I think it's based on the, some of the techniques that you um, showed in your presentation. And the question is, can we use the blood in glass with the drop of factor eight or factor nine for village outreach to do instant diagnosis? Uh, for sure, because it is, uh, doesn't require any laboratory equipment. Uh, it just needs very simple uh, you know, uh, syringe and needle, which of course uh, the personnel should be very careful about sample, collecting a sample from a bleeder. 
Uh, and of course, uh, yes, if they have harvested the factory concentrate and they've diluted it adequately, which is also not easy, not difficult to dilute because we are just using normal saline, which is widely available in any hospital or with any healthcare per professional. So it can be used as a, uh, definitely as a near patient testing. All right, thank you. Now for uh, Dr. Malangu, there's another question here and says, you know, thank you for emphasizing the role patients and families play in hemophilia comprehensive care. In your experience, are there tools you have used to assure their involvement in this process? Thank you, a very important question. I mean, in everything that we do, um, we tend to uh, aspire to measure. And um, in the context of, of patients, uh, there are a number of tools that we use. Uh, for example, um, in, in, in our setting, we, we tend to uh, you know, challenge patients. Uh, uh, how, many, how many bleeds do they actually have that they were not aware of? And how many bleeds did, did they have that were not recorded? Uh, and, and, and narrow that gap between what, what they are making as a diagnosis and what they are missing as a diagnosis. Just as an example, um, in as far as the families are concerned, uh, in fact, I'm sitting at the moment in uh, our national meeting, the South African MASAC meeting. Uh, we measure the involvement of the patients by the, the number of participants uh, in, in various uh, efforts that we, we undertake. Uh, for example, how many of our patients actually do come to uh, the, the, the regional meetings and, and, and their participation, etc. I mean, one can be as, as creative as you want to at the end of the day, but the critical element is we do measure the, the extent to which one is able to, uh, to deliver the care that, uh, that we're delivering. Thank you, Johnny. Um, now, another question has come up uh, for, for Dr. Neme, and it is, you know, how did you get the government to cover replacement therapies? And I understand, you know, it's going to vary from one government to another institutions, but if you can give him maybe just an idea of maybe what was done in, 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 in Argentina. Well, um, actually, we worked a lot with, with the Ministry of Health to introduce the concentrates into the program of a high-cost medication, um, such as cancer drugs. Uh, so they, uh, that, um, in that way, uh, the concentrates would be free for patients. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, um, a question for, for Dr. Nair. Um, you know, I, I understand that, you know, sometimes there are issues with the, with the, uh, with the shipment sometimes of reagents and things like that. And the question is, you know, what to do if we fear the cold chain has been interrupted with reagents arriving, you know, to a specific place or institution? Yes, uh, that is uh, definitely uh, a big issue. So the thing is, um, I realized that uh, when we were, uh, I was doing live workshops in many of the countries, I used to take reagents, uh, you know, like uh, Steve Kitchens used to also do the same thing. But then I realized that uh, when I, even an APTT reagent, which should be uh, not that affected, even that gets affected during transportation in, you know, on the flight. So I started requesting the uh, manufacturers to, ship the reagent uh, based on their uh, cold chain uh, criteria. And then most of the workshops started going very well. So uh, obviously uh, that cold chain maintenance is very, very important, not only during transportation, but even during uh, storage, sometimes in customs hold, and sometimes even in the uh, laboratory. So because the manufacturer knows what is the ideal temperature for the reagent, only thing is, it is, uh, they know the the conditions uh, which they have control on. They don't have the control on the other condition. So they have to ensure um, that, you know, the cold chain has to be maintained uh, in all the places where the transit, the reagent will get to before it's being used for the laboratory purpose. So even in the a simple example that I showed that if the vial is spending most of its time in the fridge, a APTD vial, and not at, at all outside, uh, a APTD vial, which is supposed to be uh, having stability only for one week. You can use it for over a year. Uh, the reason why they say one week is because they only have control on their conditions. 
they don't have any control on the laboratory's condition. So uh, if laboratory can maintain the condition and of course use quality control by doing this modification, again, using their own uh, manufactured in-house controls, uh, it is possible to use reagents beyond the expiry date. Yeah, I think that's that's very important uh, because I mean I think you showed ways that you know the laboratories actually could be able to save a lot of money and and definitely reagent. So I, I think that that those tips are 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 excellent. Thank you very much. Now, um, Johnny, you talked about you know the 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 model, the comprehensive model, and the question is. In a conversion of an HTC to an HCCC, what should be the order of priorities, if there are any, you know, to be able to do this conversion? Very important question again. Um, my impression is it, it really depends on where you are um, in that spectrum. Um, I, would, I would prioritize um, the, the 24 hour services. Uh, because those are uh, uh, just a, a, a nice add-on to what you already do. Um, so, so the the twenty-four hour clinical service, the twenty-four hour lab service, uh, the twenty-four hour specialist uh, service, to me would be the the, the priorities. Because you now there's no point in uh, having a, an HCCC where the patient care at at the hospital may well not meet the requirement of an HCCC. Uh, and of course, uh, more importantly for me would be to start to uh, look at the complexity of the diagnostic process that one is putting in place. You know, uh, if you're able to do what uh, uh, Sukesh is already doing, uh, add on to that, to the level where in fact you become the reference center uh, for your country. Uh, and that, that actually to me is a priority uh, in, in order to be able to convert from an HTC to an HCCC. Yeah, I think you bring an important point, Johnny, there, which again, the lab, how, how, how important is that laboratory? Uh, because yeah. if you don't, if you're not making a reliable diagnosis, then you just can't really make predictions. You can't treat your patients adequately. So I think that part is critical when you're trying to form you know, that HCCC to, to be able to get you know, at least even one laboratory in the country, that's usually how many countries start with a single laboratory that is reliable. And then from there, other people can get trained. And I think that's extremely important. Um, now there's another question here um, in regards to, you know, how do you really, how do you, can you start or introduce prophylaxis in a program? And maybe Dr. Neme might be able to help us. You know, if, if they're gonna maybe, are in the process of starting prophylaxis, what can you give a, you know, what kind of information should they have or they know about how to start it, you know, in let's say in a country that has not been developed prophylaxis yet? Yes, uh, well, I think that again, we have to think that prophylaxis is the best treatment for patients uh, or with uh, severe hemophilia. So if, um, if I uh, have to plan uh, um, how to introduce a, a prophylaxis treatment, I think that we have to think about uh, children. I mean, uh, I will start to uh, focus on a primary prophylaxis for uh, pups or, um, or, or, or children uh, with few um, exposure days. Um, and, and try to start a prophylaxis um, a, um, maybe at two years old, two to three. Uh, maybe um, if, if it, it, it is not possible to use uh, a, a, the high doses of uh, prophylaxis, uh, we can uh, begin with low dose of prophylaxis once a week. Uh, so uh, I think that this uh, kind of treatment uh, for sure is better than uh, to be on demand. Um, and then of course, uh, if it is possible to uh, extend the uh, treatment, the, the prophylactic treatment to um, all at ages or at least uh, for 
children and in and adolescents. Uh, I I you think uh, um, in in these groups at at the beginning. Okay, thank you, Doctor. I mean, and I think there are you know already many publications also using low dose prophylaxis. You know, in in many countries, uh, when there is you know not a lot of factor it's available. So certainly, like you said, you know, any type of prophylaxis is better than no prophylaxis. That, that is very important. Um, now a question for, for Dr. Nair, um, and it is related to, again, uh, you know, those mixing tests. And it says, you know, in a known case of hemophilia, can the mixing test be a reliable one to exclude the presence of inhibitors and proceed with a surgical emergency? Yes, so, um, you know, um, I had actually typed in the answer for that question, but I will tell you again that mixing studies will miss factor rate inhibitors, but only when they are in very low titers, uh, usually around four to five beta star units. Higher titers, uh, higher in high titer inhibitors will definitely show up as a non correction in regular mixing studies. However, if the history is highly suggestive of a risk of inhibitor, and if you get normal mixing studies, then you have to go ahead with an inhibitor screen. To reveal the dependent, uh, the uh, the time dependent factor rate inhibitors. Now, obviously, when we are here, we are talking about low titer inhibitors, and sometimes it's a, a good chance that you could miss a low titer inhibitor even on an inhibitor screening. So there is no harm in actually going ahead and doing uh, a, a low titer beta assay. That is, you know, you don't go beyond a dilution of one in four or one in five because after that, definitely mixing some of the screening tests will definitely pick it up. But one in, uh, one, in, uh, one in four to one in eight dilution up to that, if you can just do a better assay, because if the surgery, patient is going in for surgery, uh, screening test will miss, uh, could miss low, low titer inhibitor. It may be a good idea. But, you know, again, history will direct you to do that, that you will do a, a low titer better assay to not miss a factor inhibitor before an invasive procedure. Okay, thank you. If, if, if I could add, um, Absolutely. Well, that uh, I mean, all of what uh, Dr. Prof. Nair said is, it should be put into the context of the reliability of the result from that lab, both from the technical performance and competency point of view and the quality assurance of that lab. Um, you know, one doesn't want to be caught up in interpreting uh, you know, data that clearly uh, is a reflection of poor technical performance. Thank you, Johnny, for, for, for that clarification. And now, um, Johnny, going back again to the, to the model, uh, the question is, in my country, there's no HCCC within the government hospital network. What recommendations do you have for establishing services, let's say in public hospitals? What is the role of health care authorities and the Ministry of Health here? I think, I think uh, it's a very important question. Um, and the good starting point is what I alluded to in the presentation, defining the roles of the, the, the important role players. Uh, and I, I've given you some benchmarks that we use uh, all the time in our setting. In other words, define the role of the hematologist, the lab, uh, the hemophilia nurse, and the physiotherapist, or anyone else that you have at your center. Once everyone is clear of what their role is, is the next step is to start to allow them to be able to take the next step. In other words, if my role is diagnosis, I should be able to do it to international standards. If, if my role is uh, a hemophilia nurse who is uh, teaching um, you know, families and friends, I should be able to have the resources to be able to do that. Um, the resources, of course, uh, are freely available from the WFH and other centers. Uh, once you've got that in place, in other words, you, you've defined the individuals, their role and the resources, then you can go out and start to convince people how well you do what you do. Uh, once people get a sense that you are doing something, but you're not doing it as well as what they expect, they will be very much hesitant to come on board and help you. But if you go with full confidence, that you are able to do what you do extremely well, uh, you'll be surprised how many people actually want to be associated with you. 
Uh, and I can give you many examples. I mean, we do clinical trials and uh, we have established that in fact, we actually do clinical trials very well and people know us for doing clinical trials. And therefore I don't have to go and look for clinical trials. In fact, people who want to do clinical trials come to us and, 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 and we are approached. And you could do the same. In fact, it doesn't matter what role you define. To me, that is probably the most critical thing. Be the best at what you do. Uh, and, and, and the rest will follow. Thank you, Johnny. Now, a, po a question for, for uh, Dr. Nair, um, and it is in relation to the newborns. You know, it says, you know, why newborns, both the PT and the PTT, is prolonged while after some months both get normal? So, uh, yes, uh, they are prolonged, but they are not abnormal because uh, most of the uh, healthcare centers which do PT and APTT, especially in children, they actually send out the results against the reference range established in adults. You should start using reference range which are specific for children. So when you use reference ranges which are specific for children, you will find that those prolonged times are not abnormal, but they're only prolonged but compared to uh, normal reference ranges which are used for adults. Uh, and of course, the reason for that is that uh, babies are born with uh, lower coagulation factors, especially vitamin K dependent factors. And over a period of time, they build up uh, uh, in insufficient time. So then they, so obviously, you know, uh, at birth, uh, then after a week, then after a month, the reference ranges keep on changing. So it's advisable to interpret the APTT and PT of children and neonates uh, against the reference range, which is meant for uh, their, uh, I mean, the age, age dependent reference range. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that's an important point. Um, so I think we have only time for one last question. Um, and I'd like to ask Dr. Neme. Uh, and, and the question is, in your experience in your hemophilia center, how, will you, how did you uh, were able to integrate the patients into the hemophilia uh, center itself? You know, what kind of uh, strategies did you able to use to be able to get those patients to your center? Yeah, I think that, uh, again, it is important to um, engage uh, people with the hemophilia uh, to be involved in the organization of patients. In our case, um, it's also the center of treatment um, in, in Argentina. Um, and of course, they have to be uh, involved in the workshops. Uh, they can uh, participate in group of patients. We also have a group of parents. Um, they, uh, we organize um, uh, recreational activities uh, so they can uh, share experiences with uh, the other patients. Uh, so again, I think that uh, even when uh, you can reach only a group of patients or maybe it's not uh, all the patients that you uh, expect to, to uh, wait. So uh, again, it's important, even if it is a, a small number of patients, uh, it is good, uh, it is the beginning um, and you, you, you have to always uh, have to um, the, the possibility to to engage them and um, invite them to be involved in the organization. Thank you, uh, Dr. Neme. Uh, well, unfortunately, we have got to the end of the webinar, uh, but you know we hope that we were able to provide you with uh, you know important information about you know, the hemophilia treatment center, the comprehensive care, the uh, laboratory diagnosis, the networking, all the, the information that is necessary to be able to provide care, uh, you know, to your patients. Um, i like to, you know, thank certainly all the speakers for their important input. Uh, thank you to all the participants for joining today. Uh, and certainly for the World Federation of Hemophilia to, to be able to put this kind of webinar, uh, you know, together. Uh, now the PAC Comprehensive Care Series will continue on November 11 uh, with 
Uh, the other topic will be strengthening comprehensive care using data to inform clinical practice. So we really hope to see you there. And again, thank you very much for your participation.